Hey everyone, I want to welcome you to another edition of Westman Hope. And over the last uh, three months, we've, we've conducted a number of interviews from people across Westman, especially as it relates to uh, COVID-19. And again, you know, we've, as we've heard from across the country and around the world, we're, we're thankful that we can get news from, you know, these other locations. But at times we just want to hear, you know, people in our own backyard, how is this impacting them? And how are they navigating through uh, kind of this, this season where, where everything is, is shut down? And thankful for the individuals who have taken the time to, to come be with us. But as we've heard the stories from different individuals from across Westman, one of the things that we want to always infuse into our conversations is hope. And as we think of hope, uh, we've described it, you know, over the last three months that hope, not like kind of wishful thinking, like I hope we get through this. Like that's not what we're talking about when we talk about the hope. Rather, we're talking about a, um, a hope that becomes our ballast. It, it becomes our trust. It becomes what we place our faith in. And for followers of Jesus Christ, our hope, our ballast, our center, our power to kind of help us get through uh, this this season and, and really all seasons of life is the resurrected Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ conquered death. Um, he conquered sin. And so that becomes our stabilizing force. Um, and so I come to the, to the words from 1 Peter where it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is the hope that we are talking about. And so today we have uh, Andrew and Jen Vickruck who are going to be joining us. Uh, Andrew serves in our Canadian military. Uh, he's just come back from overseas. And, and in fact, right now they're in a 14-day lockdown isolation as, as um, you just make sure that uh, everyone's... Uh, okay and good and so they are coming from their home and we get to hear a little bit of their story so Andrew and Jen thank you so much for for joining us I want to welcome you to Westman Hope and thanks so much for your willingness to kind of share your story you know, why don't you tell us a little bit you know about how you made your way to Westman because you've been here for about two years but you didn't grow up in this region um, tell us kind of you know, how you met, where you came from, and how you got to Westman. Okay, well, I'll start with the first part, I guess. Um, we um, are both from the East Coast. I'm from Nova Scotia, and Andrew's from New Brunswick, and we grew up about half an hour apart from each other. And um, I had just finished teacher's college and was uh, teaching full-time in Moncton, and Andrew was living in Ontario at the time, but I was um, roommates with a youth pastor that worked with his dad and um, I knew his family very well. So when he moved back from Ontario, um, we met and started dating not long after, I guess a few months after that and um, got married less than a year later <laughs> and just before he was enlisting in the military. Um, and that was 10 years ago. We celebrated our 10th anniversary while he was deployed to Kuwait um, this year, and you gotta love ten year <laughs> anniversaries. That's a that's a big one. So, <laughs> how did you how how did you celebrate your tenth anniversary then? <laughs> well, we were supposed to celebrate <laughs> that this summer by going yeah. to Hawaii, but that's not okay. going to happen. Yeah. Uh, not right now. So, mm -hmm. uh, I got flowers. He he still yeah. um, had <laughs> someone deliver flowers, so that was awesome. Oh, nice, nice. And uh, yeah, and then we. Yeah, that, that, that was about it yeah. on, on the day. And then, uh, it's pretty it's pretty hard to be, you know, too romantic, you know, when you're like a few thousand miles away from each other. Yeah. yeah. We we haven't spent very many of our anniversaries together, <laughs> if I'm okay. being honest. It's not, uh, it's pretty normal. Uh, May to August is kind of a bad time to get married if your spouse is in the military. Okay. <laughs> just, so it's uh, just kind of normal for us. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, and then so uh, after that, he enlisted right right after we got married. That was kind of the plan, um, and we moved to Kingston. Uh, we were there for four years, then in Alberta for four years, and now we've been here too. 
Um, and during that time, we had two kids. Uh, Lauren is going into grade two in the fall, and Leah will start kindergarten. So very yeah, exciting. And where we're at, I guess. And and so Andrew, um, and so you know, kind of you know, asking. I mean, you're in Westman now. So how have you found um, kind of transitioning into this this part of the world? How has that how has that been for you? Uh, it's been it's been good. So originally moving to Alberta, you know, the geography was much different uh, than what we were used to out east. Uh, everything was everything was open and and lots of well, an absence of trees. So yeah. the difference is moving here to Westman was there's actual trees. Which yeah, is nice. we we do have that. <laughs> nice. And uh, there's a, there's a bit more. I don't know. We're we're really comfortable with the kind of rural setting. That's what we're used to growing up as well. Yeah. So we don't mind the fact that we're not in or next to a big city. Uh, we kind of enjoy the, the sort of, I guess, the prairie life. We're, we're accustomed to the West, I think, now. We kind of enjoy yeah. the, the sort of slower pace sometimes. Yeah. So, Andrew, you know, serving in the military, you know, we are so thankful for, for those um, who serve in our military, uh, serve to, you know, um, just serve not just our own country, but really, you know, many countries around the world. Why, why did you want to be involved in the military? So originally it was, uh, it was something I had uh, kind of toyed with in high school. I didn't join right out of high school, but I thought about it. And so ultimately I came back to it just because I think I wanted to do something meaningful. Mm -hmm. And to me, this was this was a way to to make a good contribution, to to just do something purposeful with my life. And I thought this was the the way to do it. I guess my yeah. my reasons for being in the military have evolved a little bit now that I've got a family. Some of the uh, some of the, you know the stability, not that comes with the moving around, but that comes with the having a government job and you know the the, uh, the benefits for my family and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah. So some of the reason to stay in, I guess, has become to support my immediate family, yeah. whereas it started with more of a just a, a wanting to do something with a sense of purpose. Yeah, um, and obviously, you, you know, you've, you you do you are doing something with a deep sense of purpose. So you have just gotten back, uh, just about a is it a week ago or so that you 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 got back from overseas. Um, you know where. Uh, can you tell us a little bit of what these last six months have looked for you? Uh, you know, where have you been and what, what were you kind of in, involved in uh, overseas? Yeah, so I was in Kuwait as part of uh, Operation Impact, which is the Canadian mission in the Middle East, basically. So mm -hmm. uh, what, what the point of the mission was is to do training with other countries that are there. Um, and to, to help their military, you know, modernize, let's say, and, and learn some new skills or practice those skills. Uh, so my role in Kuwait was as part of the support hub. So we basically, from the base there, are supporting the, the area uh, with all things logistical. So uh, movements of people in cargo, that's a, a big part of it. Um, there's all the the supply and transportation aspects. So whether they, you know, they need extra kit or other things, or we got to move them around with buses and that kind of stuff. So that all kind of the the sport hub basically handled all the, the support needs they might have. And so I was in the operations cell there. So basically, what we did was uh, solve problems, <laughs> either yeah. last minute problems or problems that required some fore planning. But either yeah. way, things needed to happen, and we would figure out who was the best person to do it and work with them to get it done. You know, as we were talking about this earlier on, it, it, it sort of dawned on me, I sort of had this, this picture that you were kind of um, like part military um, travel agent 
and concierge. Like it just seemed like you know all these details, and so I don't know if um, that's a term, no, that's but it's, exactly just, it's, right. it's a picture that we I had for you. So um, people in there, and they they joked that one of them joked he was nothing but a military travel advisor. The other one, <laughs> okay, I was a concierge, so that's exactly right. Oh really? Okay, yeah. It, it just yep. when you describe it, I, that's just the picture I have. Um, and, and no doubt, you know, I can only imagine the, the, the multitude of details you would have had to be uh, organizing on a daily basis. So you're over there and uh, you're, you're working on base and then all of a sudden COVID-19 hits. Um, how did that impact your role overseas, over in the Middle East? Well, it, it changed the, the mission very drastically on the whole because of course training stopped uh, because we couldn't interact with people for for everyone's safety um, so the the training that our mission was was there to accomplish basically had to stop and and be on pause uh, and then for more uh, personal level like we we implemented a lot of the same uh, distancing and protective measures that would have been done here and around the world, things like masks and not, you know, we started meeting outside so we could space our chairs out and not be in close proximity. Mm -hmm. uh, we started doing a takeout food instead of eating in the dining hall to try to just uh, minimize our time in contact with people, those kinds of things. Yeah. And, and really not able to, to, to leave the base then? Or were you able to kind of go out to, you know, into the surrounding communities at all? Uh, no, yeah, not really. Um, so I never really left the base. And even the people who would uh, periodically leave the base to go in to buy things locally or things like that, yeah, it was much restricted and there was very little movement at all. Uh, so yeah, we basically just stayed on the base even more than we normally would have. Wow. That's, and, and so you're over there um, kind of navigating all these operations. You know, what, did, how, what impact did you see your um, colleagues? Like what, what difference um, is, is being made over in the Middle East right now? And how are there, is there any kind of story that sort of stands out of, of how you see uh, things being impacted by, by our military in that um, region? Yeah, so it's it's hard to see the the impact of it when uh, during during this COVID time because yeah. our um, contact with all the host nations is is quite limited, of course. Uh, so I think I think it is a hard impact to see because it's yeah. it deals with stability in the Middle East. So you kind of don't notice it till something goes wrong, right? Yeah. Uh, you can, you don't really notice what's happening in the Middle East until there's a terrorist attack somewhere or something like that. So I think that the the effect is, that we're trying to accomplish is real, but it's kind of one you won't notice if it goes right. You'll yeah. notice when something bad happens. So if we're not seeing things on the news, that means it's it's being successful. And yeah, in a small part, yes. Basically. Yeah, good. And then so Jen, uh, you know, Andrew leaves and, you know, then you've, you've kind of got, you know, your systems, you're a very organized individual, uh, you love to plan, but, you know, over these last six months, a lot of probably the things that you had planned or the things that you thought this last, you know, six months is, is Andrew was going to be gone, that all kind of changed. So, you know, how have you been able to kind of navigate? What is, what is your world look like kind of keeping the home fires a burning, uh, per se? Um, well, yeah, you, you're hit the nail on the head with that. We had lots of plans to keep us busy while Andrew was gone. We were planning March break trips and my friend was coming to visit from Quebec and my mom was maybe going to come. Like we had lots of plans to keep us busy. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, that all went out the window. So, um, we found a new way to keep busy and that was working at home and doing school at yeah. home and all of those other things. So, um, as much as like I was dreading that time, um, it was good. It was, it was definitely, it had its days, but, um, we definitely kept busy without, um, any problem. We had, um, 
my mom used to just like Michael's kits for the kids to do crafts and, you know, yeah. things like that to keep busy. Andrew's parents sent us a board game, like just stuff like people sending us little things to kind of be distractions for the kids and stuff. And, um, yeah, like we had a routine, we had a schedule and we stuck with it best we could and, um, powered through and <laughs> just kept going and, I think yeah. because I was working still at home and, and managing everything, the time really flew by anyway. Um, and wow. it wasn't as horrible as I kind of had thought when we first started. Like, oh, no, we have to go home. And yeah, yeah. So, you know, the one thing I've really, you know, appreciated about, you know, both of you, um, I, I've always just admired your relationship. Uh, every time I've had a conversation with you, it's, it's just very obvious um, you love each other and you like each other. And, you know, that's um, admirable. I, I've, I've always admired that about you. And always admired kind of the, the, the foundation of your faith in Jesus Christ as part of that. How has your faith in Jesus Christ sort of grounded you, brought you um, uh, a ballast, kind of this expectant trust in Jesus? How has that kind of stabilized kind of these last six months for you? Um, okay. for me, um, it's just like the little things we talked about, um, having like God go before us and kind of just take care of us, um, with things like daycare and closing down and, um, thinking I was going to still have to go to work. Well, what was I going to do with the kids? <laughs> and mm -hmm. like, am I going to have to quit my job? Am I going to like take all my sick days? But like, just just like in working out those details and having friends come alongside and be like don't worry about it we'll like we'll help you we'll figure it out together and like you know like we can <laughs> alternate sick days if we need to or mm -hmm. you know things like that but then like god saying no it's okay like we'll figure this out and like then being able to work from home and then um a little three months later going back to work and having to go back to school but um still not having daycare and um, like then there was a camp that opened that actually Leah wasn't even old enough to go to, but because they didn't have very many kids, they let her go anyway. Hmm. Um, and like just little things like that, taking care of us and providing all those little needs for us along the way. And so that's just really like helped me to see like God through it all. And like, just that he's taking care of us and yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. How about for you, Andrew? Yeah, a lot of what she said um, was helpful, just seeing, being able to see how things were taken care of here because, of course, I couldn't be here. Mm -hmm. um, not that I would have kept them safe from COVID, but yeah. <laughs> at least, you know, I could have been uh, been helpful. So it was, it was really encouraging to see uh, those details get worked out. Um, we, had, we had a chapel on the base there, and uh, so that was good to kind of go every every sunday we were still working but we you know take some time off to go and mm -hmm. uh, and hang out with the the padre there and talk about about some some spiritual things and kind of get a little reset that way yeah and uh, and specifically for me a big comfort was our the fact that our marriage is based on on faith and so then we had that yeah. that strong foundation that would survive me going away for 6 months and i i knew that we would you know come back to to being strong when I got back and because a lot of people that come back from tour, they don't necessarily, they don't necessarily come back to the same relationship they left. Yeah. So I was, that was a big sense of security for me to know what I was coming home to. So that, I'd say that was a big role that God played in, in my own sense of peace there. Yeah. You know, it was, it was exciting to follow your story and, and, you know, I was more in touch with Jen kind of over these last number of months and just, you know, that anticipation and excitement, uh, y you know, for, for what you were doing overseas, but also that excitement of, you know, he's going to be coming home and, and we were celebrating and cheering you guys on as, as, you, as you've been able to kind of have your family back together um, in this season. And so uh, thanks so much for, for sharing this. How can we be praying for, for military families? Like you talked about, and, I, I, and even as I've been praying for you, I, I thought about that. It's got to be tough, you know, six months away. I mean, you've been living these separate lives and, and fairly intense lives. And then all of a sudden you're back in the same, you know, 
home together, that, you know, there's got to be some transitions there. So I've been praying for you, but, but you, you've mentioned this with other military families. Like, how can we be praying for, um, for you and for other military families, you know, in this season and even, even beyond this season? Well, I know that uh, Shiloh still has a bunch of people that are deployed in Ukraine. Um, I'm not sure if there's any in Latvia right now, but there was uh, last year, I know. Uh, so there are still some people that are, are deployed, and and for the people that aren't, there's some uh, training coming up. So in the mm -hmm. fall, there'll be some different training going on, and then into the winter, and probably going to Wainwright for a couple months next spring, which is always always interesting and difficult to be away from home. Uh, yeah. The the tempo on bases like Shiloh that are you know an operational units like the, that are going places and doing things, the temple can be quite high, which can get, uh, can wear families down over time for mm -hmm. sure. Good. Well, uh, as we close off, can I, I, I'd like to pray with you. So, um, so let's pray, not just for you, but also for, uh, for our military families. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for Andrew and Jen. I thank you for their love for each other and their, how their love for each other is really based and grounded in their love for you. I thank you for the, how they've been able to share their story of how um, they've been navigating this season. But I pray that as, as, as they move forward, they would continue to enjoy uh, the, the blessings of, of their family. Um, I pray that as they are in the same uh, four walls again, uh, pray that that would be just a deep sense of joy for them. I pray for our other military families who are still separated. I thank you for each one who is serving our country and our world. Uh, Lord, we don't take these positions for granted. We don't take those that serve in this capacity for granted, but we give you thanks. Uh, thank you for, for individuals uh, like Andrew who said, I just want to, I want to make a difference in the world. And I thank you that he's been able to do that. And um, pray for strong military families. Pray that, that uh, as families are, are separated and isolated from each other, that when, when they do come back together, that your, your peace would, would reign in their lives and in their marriages, and may it bring glory to your name. And so I thank you for the hope that we have, um, not in peace in the world or not in um, even safety in the world, but a hope that is far deeper than that, a hope that is in... Um, uh, the, the person and the work of Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ defeated sin and death. And I thank you that in that hope we come and, and we can receive uh, the salvation that he offers us. And so, Father, may you bless uh, the Vickrick family and we give you thanks for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, Andrew and Jen, I want to thank you so much for, for taking the time to be with us. Thank you as well for serving our country. Again, we don't take this for granted. We are appreciative for the way in which you, um, you, you serve us. And so trust that you'll, as you finish off your uh, last week of, of kind of quarantine, um, pray that, uh, just be praying for you that uh, it'll be a good week for you. For the rest of everyone else, I want to thank you for joining us. Thank you for hearing the story of, of Andrew and Jen. Uh, if you enjoyed hearing their story, why not like and share this uh, with others that uh, you know that this might be an encouragement to. But we hope that wherever you are, that you know the hope that is in Jesus Christ. So thank you for joining us. Have a great week, everyone. God bless.